Herbie. 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 Oh, hello, Herbie. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on the chair as well. On the chair. Nice. <laughs> he likes to be right, right in the middle of the action. So, That's, yeah. Is, well, he looks co- cozy. Yeah, yeah, totally. And asleep. <laughs> Fast asleep. Yeah. Let's let's hope he stays like that. Is he Maltese or what is he? No, he's a toy poodle. Toy poodle. Cool. Toy poodles have higher IQs than most of us. Honestly, he is so smart. Like he helps my son with his calculus homework. He doesn't, <laughs> shed. <laughs> he doesn't shed and he's really a lovely dog. So cool. Happy days. Yeah. And you <laughs> like him a lot by the sounds of it. <laughs> well, it was one of the kids things like, oh, mom, can we get a dog? Can we get a dog? And they wore me down finally after... I don't know, years and years and years. Every day I would say, not today, not today, oh, not today. They would and ask they, every day. And they would ask every day. And without fail, the day that we secretly decided to get a dog, she, my daughter didn't ask. Uh, no way. I was just like, she knew. So we planned a secret lunch that we were going for a pub lunch out in Leatherhead. She said, why are we going to Leatherhead? <laughs> and then we stopped, said, oh, we just need one stop along the way. And, uh, she said, oh, we're going to play with these puppies, mommy? So what, you could take him home. She started crying, no way. like real sobbing, crying. Oh, I was holding him and she so still cute. said, yeah, she still said, the, this 26th of August was the, one of the best days of my life ever. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you, you said to her, I almost didn't get the dog because you didn't ask for it that day. <laughs> exactly. exactly. An exercise in pure persistence. Yeah, yeah, for wow. sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, know, you don't ask, you don't get. Eh? This is a good That's lesson. <laughs> absolutely. And this is always what I'm trying to teach her, both of the kids, is learn to ask for what you want. Because mm, so important. I can't remember who said it, but something along the lines of you can get anything you want if you're willing to ask a thousand people. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Cool. Well, Good morning, Mandy Leto. Uh, welcome to the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Let's play. Uh, cool, definitely. <laughs> yeah, we're really, really looking forward to chatting to you. Um, I think that you had uh, Dr. Heather McKee on your podcast and uh, somehow you know, found out about us um, through her. She's such a fantastic lady, seriously, like full of so much great advice and, and wisdom and, and great energy, isn't she? I absolutely love super intelligent fun people Mm -hmm. this is part of my business plan is to hang around with fun intelligent people that inspire me so yeah it was a no-brainer to contact you guys yeah that's kind of you thank you yeah thanks a lot yeah there's something there's just something cool about hanging hanging around people that are super smart that can articulate themselves well and can like have good discussions i think it's it just helps like in that growth sort of side of things which is fantastic and then yeah we certainly learned a lot from her so you're also living in wimbledon now um which is my old stomping ground <laughs> i lived there for like <laughs> eight years or, or something like that and, and totally loved it and and the, the interesting thing about our stories is we we're both investment bankers and now we're both coaches so for some you know strange reason or a great reason this world is bringing us together and it's uh, mm-hmm. you know it's uh, yeah it's just cool to be able to speak to you Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this. Uh, cool stuff. So, so we like to start our, our um, podcast with people's stories um, and, and your story is a fascinating one. Um, uh, you are like a, a farm girl, actually. You grew up in uh, rural Canada um, you're the oldest daughter to your folks. Uh, your, your dad was a teacher and your mom a floral designer. Um, and we're always envious of people that have grown up like on farms. We, we kind of just love that, that sort of setup. So maybe you can just take us back a little bit to what life, what life was like for you growing up on the farm. Life was idyllic, actually, as a child. We had a lot of wildlife around. My parents owned a lot of land in northern Ontario. We had, we had a hobby farm. It wasn't it wasn't massive. We had some cows and pigs and chickens and my parents did their own gardening. And it was just idyllic to have these, I think they had 52 acres of land where we would just roam around. And, you know, we also needed to be careful because there were cougars and wolves and bears. And I always thought that was hilarious when I moved to England, because I asked, I asked about wolves and bears and they said, wow, we haven't had those in hundreds of years, honey. So, (laughs) so, just growing up also the winters were were beautiful tobogganing and ice skating and and cross-country skiing canada is a phenomenal place 
having said that, one of my earliest childhood memories was making pancakes with my mom on Christmas morning. We had this tradition where we would take breakfast to our neighbors at stupid o'clock. So we got up at about four o'clock in the morning to make pancakes and we looked outside and there was a big, there was so much snow that there was a timber wolf looking right into our wow. kitchen. Obviously it must've smelled good with all the butter and everything. There was a timber wolf looking right into our, into our kitchen window. Wow. Wow. And uh, yeah, that was life. We had raccoons and all sorts of creatures, which, mm. Which was, uh, as I said, in many ways, an idyllic childhood. Yeah, exactly. Why we are so jealous. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and like, were your were your folks were they um, were you eating like the the veggies and things from your own uh, farm or, or? It was definitely farm to plate. So we would we would pick oh. them all and wash them all and haul them all into the shed and yeah. There was, and same thing with the meat. So that was something yeah. that we learned early on and never really, it, it gave me a little bit of trouble because as kids, we named all our chickens, right? Uh -huh. And then, then on the, you know, you kind of knew which one of your friends you were eating and it was, yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge as a kid. I just had to kind of not think about it too much. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is difficult for sure. But, but at the same time, I think it's, it's actually a really important lesson for kids is to learn where food comes from, you know, rather than you just buy it on a shelf in a supermarket and you have this beautiful chicken breast, you know what I mean? Like that's right. It gives you this uh, good perspective, I think. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so Mandy, as a, as a young eight year old kid, uh, used to hide in your closet, uh, writing stories and novels and poems. Um, and then you'd rip up the pages, um, scared that someone would read them and maybe laugh. Why was that? I think ever since I was a child, I got the message from my school teacher father, who was, you know, he, he grew up in very different circumstances too, with no running water and very, very rural. And he wanted to pull himself up by his bootstraps and make something of his life. So he was the first one in his family ever, as long as we know, to go to university. And he became a school teacher. And he came from a problematic family. His parents were both alcoholics and, you know, we're, we're talking real, real wildlife when he'd ski to school. And, you know, sometimes he'd take a pistol to school in case there were big wolves in this, in the woods wow. and, you know, the stuff you read about in Russian fairy tales. <laughs> <laughs> so he had, um, he had a challenging childhood and I think his intention, it's taken me almost half a century to come to peace with this. His intention was good, but he drove me relentlessly to achieve as a child. And I think it was because he figured out his golden ticket was through education. That was how he was going to transform his life and, and push away what he was escaping from in his childhood. So I've kind of come to that softer, more understanding approach. But at the time, even as a child, I was desperately seeking to please my father all the time, who was pushing me. He was a teacher at the school where I went, so there was no hiding from him. You know, I, I would always be pressured to get the top grades. And so writing, as you know, is a very creative process. And it's the hardest class to get top marks in because math is, you know, it's either right or it's wrong. Whereas something like English and writing poetry, be, particularly at the beginning when you're not very good and you're you're practicing spelling and punctuation and mm. it's clunky. And I always felt that I needed to be perfect. And that would mean that I would be loved and that I would be good enough and I would get immunity from criticism. So I was, I still had this deep calling, you know, that was geysering up in me that I wanted to express myself that way through words. And my mom always used to say like, go outside and play. The, the subtext was like, you're a bit weird, you know, that you read the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew that this was something that was a part of my life, that the ability to communicate and read and write was, that was really what I geeked out on as a kid. So, oh, so magic, was there, it's so important. Mm. Was there this like, the, this sort of... Um, challenge then i guess between your folks like if your dad pushed you so much but your mom was like go outside and play was it difficult there 
I think somehow behind the scenes, it they tried to balance each other out. But I think back in the day, I grew up in a very traditional family. You know, mom fell into line with whatever dad said. He was the head of the household. And it was, I think, particularly for me as a girl, and I really appreciate in some ways the being driven to achieve because there was no distinction between me and the boys, you know, that I, w- I would have to work even harder being a girl in those days. So I I always found that solace because I got praise I got praise from teachers. I realized it wasn't just from my dad. I could get praise from my teachers. And, and I learned like, Ooh, there's something to this being Mm. recognized for achieving. So yeah, I mean, of course I wasn't, I wasn't like a total freak as a child. I did go outside and play as well, but it was definitely more in that direction. I, I, I got quickly, I made the connection very quickly that achieving had certain had certain gold stars attached to it and had certain benefits attached to it. Yeah. And and you mentioned there's like three P's that sort of relate to uh, achieving. And and one of them you you touched on already was being perfect. Um, And there was a couple others, weren't there? Being passive and being pleasing. So Mm -hmm. as long as I don't rock the boat too much, and that was also the role that my mom played, that was always something that we were indoctrinated with, like don't rock the boat, don't upset the apple cart. And, you know, again, it wasn't, it was just also what she learned growing up and it was a way to keep peace in the family and and also being pleasing. So in many cases we were rolled out like the Von Trapp family. My brothers would be play instruments and, you know, I would try, but I was the smart one. They were the musical ones. And we, we would be on various stages. And also when people came to visit, we would perform our various bits and pieces for them. And because I didn't really play an instrument, but I, in the second grade, I won a competition for poetry. So all that working in the closet did pay off. And I was on local TV and Mm. dressed up like a dolly and doing my thing on stages. Mm. I actually wanted to ask, did you keep some of your stuff at the end? I know you you probably tore some of it up, but you obviously had kept some of it from when you were a youngster. I think there's just that one poem that I still have that but all the rest of the stuff has been, I've changed countries and moved so many times. And so, yeah, it was all just laying the groundwork for whatever's totally. coming up nowadays. And what's Did your you relationship? Journal with- yeah. Sorry. Did you journal at all? Oh yeah. Well? I had, I had diaries with little pad, t- little tiny padlocks on them. And <laughs> yeah, I, I journaled words. throughout my whole life. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Writing in code and hieroglyphics and, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know why. Yeah. It just felt so mortifying that those private thoughts would be somehow discovered. And I was so scared that people were going to point and laugh and, you know, my brother was going to take it to school and everybody was going to be, you know, that was like one of my nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so I remember back in the day, like, uh, you know, it was really cool to write love letters. Um, and it was like the best thing ever was to receive a love letter, like, you know, um, but also then you, you also didn't want people to read these. So we also had codes, like, like ways of writing. I think it was like you swap the first two letters or first two or, f- or first and last letters of the word. And, and, you know, so people didn't know, but everyone was doing it. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They knew the code, but, but what is your relationship with your dad like now? Or, or, or what did you, did it improve? It only improved. I found it much easier to like my dad after he was dead uh, and he died not much older than I will be soon. So he was not much older than me when he died. So it's been a while since he's been gone. And he was kind of a tragic figure in many ways because I I look at how he grew up and what he tried to make of himself. And I think the, I think the pressures of, of being first generation of somebody who's made it. And my mom was pregnant with me and he was trying to finish teacher's college. And I suppose he didn't get to actually fulfill his potential. And I didn't know this. He kept it from us, but my, my mom told me afterwards that he would always, when he'd have too much to drink and he would cry and he'd say like, I never, fulfilled my potential. Wow. So it was almost like he was passing the baton on to me to was like, I couldn't do it. So I want to live vicariously through you. Mm-hmm. And that's just my, I'm, I'm interpreting his behavior this way. But 
I think at the time, especially when I started to get more hormonal and more teenagerish, I started to really resent the being micromanaged and being pushed and being fed that, you know, you're never going to be good enough if you don't work hard. And this, so this, mm. this script became very engrooved into my mind that unless I'm constantly producing high quality work, I'm not enough. Hmm. And okay. this was a driver for me. And it, also made me very, very successful because I gave up at a certain time trying to please him because I realized that no matter what I did, it would just be a temporary, yay, good for you. But then it would all fall into a black hole again. And it was always having to do it again and again and again. And as a teenager, I just kind of middle fingered the whole thing and thought, okay, well, I can get my praise and attention from other people, other teachers, classmates. So the thing that I, he had used to lift me up, I kind of used it against him to get away from him and to get away from home. Mm. Wow. But essentially the root of the, the thing was the same. You were still just trying to sort of seeking for some kind of validation or approval. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and how it's was not conscious, obviously. It's not something that I, yeah. I had in mind, like, oh, I'm going to do this and then people will love me and think I'm good enough. It all operates you know, behind the wizard's curtain of our mind. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And how was he as a teacher? Was he also like a, um, a taskmaster in terms of, uh, you know, just with his students and that, or was it mainly just directed at you? No, I think he was, he had high expectations, but I think he reserved that special extra oomph for me, of course. <laughs> So, yeah, I think I got, I got the brunt of it, particularly because I was often made a model you know, this is what good looks like. Mm. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of pressure as a youngster. Wow. And you mentioned, um, you know, your musical brothers and, uh, you know, being <laughs> put on stage with your family. Um, there, was this, there was a story about your grandmother who brought, brought a musical instrument over from Finland. Um, mm. And uh, you, you, as you mentioned, you were the one that was more like maths and poetry and things. You were, you're not very musical as much as the rest of the family. Um, but you were determined to learn and, and play this instrument. Um, why was that? It felt like a clubhouse that I didn't have the password to because my father, my mother, both of my brothers were, were musical. And I always felt like the odd one out. And I think as a young person, and even as an, as an older person, part of who we are as a human species is we want to belong. We want to belong to something. We don't want to be the odd one out. So my grandmother had brought this old folk instrument called a, a zither. It's kind of like a, an auto harp. It's, it lays on your lap. And so I learned how to pluck out an old folk song on this zither. And I played it every day for hours and hours. I had big blisters on my fingers because we had um, that summer, there was a big Finnish festival in Northern Ontario where people from all around the world would congregate. And I said that I put my hand up and I wanted to play this song at this particular festival. And as I said, it was very important. My father was a pillar of the community and I didn't know what that meant as a child, but it sounded important. So the day of the concert, we were sitting in the kitchen and he was, he interestingly was tonging my hair and huh. he seemed so disappointed when my hair didn't hold the curl and I was like, oh, even my hair can't get it right. Oh and God. so eventually he put my hair into pigtails and I put on my little red dress and, and I was really excited that this was going to be my moment. And I remember sitting there and my little feet didn't reach the floor. I was sitting on the chair waiting and all of a sudden the curtain started to squeak open. Wow. And all the lights on the stage, they were blinding. It was like all these little stars of Bethlehem. And it took me a, a minute to to just get my composure. And of course I could hear my heart hammering in my ears and, and my stomach. I thought, Oh my God, I'm just going to lose my breakfast here all over the stage. <laughs> and I remember there was a man who was opening the curtains and he said, okay, honey, go ahead. And I was in this time warp continuum, like deer in the headlights. And, and so I had these two sticky pieces of masking tape on the strings where I was supposed to start. And I thought if I can only find those two strings and there I was like with this big pasted on smile and these spirograph eyes <laughs> staring into the audience. And then I started to play and it was like my fingers remembered all and I sort of relaxed wow. into it. And then right near the end, there was like this little bit of a tricky 
jaunty bit at the end. And I was already imagining that we were going to have ice cream and my dad was going to pick me up and spin me around. And I was trying to see my parents in the audience. And then I, mis- I made a mistake. And then I made another mistake. And the, the microphone was like right over top of the zither. And I just remember everything turned into slow-mo, like as if I was underwater. And it just oh. reverberated through the audience and my heart sank. And I finished the piece and I got up and I just shot off of stage as if I had been fired from a cannon. And everybody was clapping because like I was a little kid and I had yeah, played yeah. this old instrument that nobody had even seen in decades. And they probably thought that was super cute, but all I could think about was like, I had messed up and now we weren't gonna have ice cream. And, and my dad got really angry with me in the car oh. and he said, you, did you hear all those mistakes that you made? And oh, I kind of like just pulled out of my body, which turned out to be a really useful skill in life. And I thought that was like the first moment I realized that it's really bad to make mistakes in public and I will never ever do anything I'm not already good at. Hmm. Wow. That's oh. insane. Yeah. Hmm. It's, 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 it's crazy how you, you that's, that just affirmed something inside of you. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy at that age. And then you just, that, like you say, it, it steered you in the, in a, in a very definite direction away and towards something that you knew you knew. And that's uh, wow. It's crazy how moments like that can just be a real fork in the road. They can, they can. And that was definitely, I had, I had completely suppressed that until I was speaking with a coach and she asked me some questions around failure and why, why I was so afraid to fail and what did I decide it would mean about me if I failed at something. And that question just completely stopped me in my tracks. I had never consciously thought about what I decided it would mean about me Hmm. if I failed at something because I had so consciously sidestepped around any of those landmines of failure and did the thing I was good at, which was, well, that's not entirely true. I, I led a kind of imposter career because I was so, my, my true calling was writing. And I was so afraid to get it wrong that I decided instead I was gonna study history and I, went all the way. I did a PhD in history Hmm. because that was a way of still like with history, kind of like math, it's either right or it's wrong. I mean, there is some interpretation of documents that don't exist and all that, but I could use my writing skills, but I still had those guidelines that I could still make sure that I wasn't going to fail. And, and how many times have you played the zither since? <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Eh? Like you know, those moments, they just, they, they just, they can destroy us or, or break us, you know? And it's so, it's such an important lesson. I think like as a parent, like you just have to encourage, you know, like it's such a important thing for your kids. Um, And uh, yeah, you know, I'm so glad you said that because my son, both of my kids are musical, which is funny that it's, it's, I can't even, you know, I can't even read music. And both of my son is very likely going to music college Mm -hmm. and he plays in the national youth jazz orchestra in London. And I went to here, they do these jams every, every month where everybody can come and they can have blow alongside professional musicians. And Mm -hmm. so he was playing saxophone there and, I remember he was playing Herbie Hancock's Watermelon Man and he hmm. was oh. just rocking the house down. He was wearing some kind of funky tiger print shirt or something and he had, <laughs> he had the look and he was moving around and he was really playing it up. And I was so proud. And then he decided he was going to sit at the piano and all of a sudden my heart stopped. I thought, oh, you're not good at the piano. You're not. Uh-huh. And he was making so many mistakes and I was looking like side-eyeing around the audience. And then I realized, wow, I teleported back into my (laughs) eight-year-old self. (laughs) And I realized that I've done something right as a parent that he feels okay to do something that he's lukewarm good at in public and not be afraid of the implications of that. (laughs) And I felt almost euphoric when I realized Mm -hmm. that. And but, yeah, it's amazing. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 um, what was your conversation with him like afterwards? I wasn't sure whether he would have the, 
the understanding and the maturity for that at the time. So I think that's something I have in my back pocket that, that we'll talk about when the time is right. Yeah. Okay. And what has your parenting been like with them? Like, have you, have you been like very conscientious about the way you do things in terms of not, you know, the stuff that you talk about all the time with your, your clients and stuff, not pushing them too hard, maybe allowing them to be themselves. Have you been re really conscientious about that with, with them? My parenting style is best described as winging it <laughs> 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 because I, at the beginning, I thought, okay, this is the kind of parent I need to set out to be. And I had all these ideas of what it was going to be like and how I was going to parent. And I read all these parenting books, which I quickly realized, bless my cotton socks. Um, it's a moment by moment thing. And one of the key things that I learned growing up, though I never appreciated at the time, is my son and my daughter are not me. And just because I'm interested in this, a particular type of thing, you know, that my dad, as I said, wanted me to kind of take on the baton that he couldn't fulfill his potential. So therefore, I was sure as heck going to fulfill mine. And mm -hmm. I, my aim is to relax into parenting as much as I possibly can, because of course, there's still instincts to drive them and push them, particularly because I know how hard it is out there. I know it's not an easy world to go into. And yet at the other hand, on the other hand, I need to trust that if I've raised them with love and I've raised them to be decent, kind, happy human beings, that they will find their way mm -hmm. because my way isn't their way. I don't even know what my way is. I'm figuring it out still at the age of 48. Like, mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. I'm winging it too, but it doesn't mean that I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. Some of the time I don't know what I'm doing, but my aim is to be as loving and to be as compassionate and as patient and boy, oh boy, sometimes, especially having a 16 year old, it does require some patience yeah, and some you. deep meditative breathing skills. <laughs> <laughs> and a wooden stick as my mom would say. <laughs> And the odd shot of whiskey now and again, but I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, I've tried to disentangle my aspirations from my children's and I try to see them as independent souls that I have the pleasure of shepherding for a little while. Mm, for sure. That's so and, cool. <laughs> and that's something in a way, I guess, like we actually need to embrace. We need to go, okay, I've got kids. I know it's going to be a challenge for sure, you know, and there's going to be these tough moments. So I, I need to embrace these tough moments, you know, and, and handle them as, as best as I can. And obviously much easier said than done, but it's, it's part of the journey, isn't it? To actually how you, how you navigate the, those moments. One of the greatest things that I've learned that works is in the moment when I feel that I'm about to absolutely lose my shiitake is yeah. take a moment and breathe. Just take one breath. It's a pattern interrupt because we're so hardwired to behave certain ways. So all of a sudden you feel the lava coming up and it's going to blow out of the volcano in a second. One breath can stop the lava from overflowing. And it might be just like, I need five minutes to think about this. And sometimes that can be such a game changer is just learning how to intuit when the feeling to blurt out or to shout or to say something that I'll later face palm over, or that's just going to escalate the situation because I'm supposed to be the grown up. Mm -hmm. But when I'm melting down, I, you know, I've also become a mud slinging 16 year old. So it's in that <laughs> moment, just learning that has been a great pattern in Trump. Just, just take one breath. Yeah. I, love that. Yeah. I think it's so important. Like just to, learn to listen to your body as well and, and learn to connect with yourself enough to know when those signs are starting because it doesn't, it's not actually instantaneous. It's actually probably coming a little bit sooner than you realize. And if you're aware of those signs and you, and you have a, like a, like you say, a pattern interrupt or a trigger for those moments, then you can prevent it coming up, but it comes back to self-awareness as well. So Clearly, you have a little bit of that, which is cool. <laughs> well, as a coach, that's what I've dedicated my life to. So I need to, I need to walk my talk as much of the time as I can. And don't get me wrong. Like, it's not like I'm an evolved Yoda who totally. ohms her way through parenting. I mean, okay, sometimes I lose it. 
Yeah. yeah. And then I have to figure out how do I get back to a place of neutral and how do I clean up the mess? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, just going back to your story a little bit, you mentioned at some point that you, you almost sort of, uh, stop worrying, I guess, what your, your dad sort of, um, feelings were towards you and like how he was pushing you, but then you shifted that onto sort of, you know, focusing on like performing for other people. Have you always felt like, did you always feel this need to kind of prove yourself? It didn't matter what the environment Again, it wasn't conscious, but because it was so dyed in the wool for me since I was small, that was my way, which now is a much older woman. I can see that was my winning strategy. All of us have a winning strategy. And that was, it's usually laid down in childhood. So I understood that if I could outwork, outperform, and be in the top, what ideally at the top, but at least in the top cohort of whatever it was that I was participating. If I could win, I was a somebody. And it was very successful. And the thing in our society too is because we're praised often. Overachievers are praised. You know, if you go into a job interview, well, what are your challenge areas? Oh, well, I'm a perfectionist or I'm an overachiever. <laughs> it's like you can be so smug about these things. Mm. And, you know, to work yourself relentlessly, this is the thing that's so insidious about overachieving and perfectionism is we're praised for it. Mm, that's true. So there's a dark side to it, but it became my winning strategy and it was incredibly successful for me, for my career. It, it got me into a lot of, through a lot of doors. It got me a lot of trophies and blue ribbons and gold stars and bonuses and various other things. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating to think of a winning strategy that we, we all have these and it's good to identify what yours is. And I presume sometimes it's good, a good winning strategy. And sometimes it's maybe it can be pathological or not, not great, you know? So um, yeah, it's great to, to actually just think of it like that. So um, just thinking, taking it back a little bit to, or moving on in your story a little bit, um, you were actually the first woman in, in your family ever to go to university, which is, which is amazing. So uh, you, then you went over to, to Cambridge um, university to do a PhD. Um, and then you got a job in investment bank. So you've done so much amazing stuff. Um, please tell us a little bit more about the investment banking career and, and what made you get into investment banking? It just doesn't fit, does it? It's really interesting because now when I look back, I think, how did that actually happen? I was having like some out of body experience or something. How did I go into banking being such a creative soul who loved to paint and write and write poetry and, and, the truth is, I thought that that part of me somehow was wrong. It was never going to pay the bills. It was all fun and games, but now it's time to get serious. So, you know, I was going to get into facts and figures. And I finished at Cambridge. I tried to get a couple of teaching jobs, but it was very, very challenging to, to get a teaching job just out of university. And I was actually working as a maternity nurse to make extra money on the side. So I would go and sleep at people's houses who had newborns and I would wake up in the night and feed and change the baby. And mm -hmm. then one morning as I was having a cup of tea before I was leaving, there was a chap I was working with and he was an, he worked for an investment bank, investment bank. And he said, you've got a PhD. What are you doing looking after my kid? And so I explained the situation to him and he said, no, oh, this is wrong. He said, we're going to, we're going to sort you out. So he got mm -hmm. me an interview him and his wife were both bankers and a friend of his was looking for somebody to work on, work on a team in a German investment bank. And I went for the interview and the rest was history. So mm -hmm. it, it was not something I had planned. And a lot of life is just, you know, what happens when you're making other plans as they say. So I went in with my PhD in history into onto this very, cavernous trading floor and there's things beeping and bleeping and and people shouting down microphones and i just remember feeling on sensory overload for the first couple of days like i could just hear even when i left the building like just all the noise of this place and it was exciting mm -hmm. and it was you know everybody in smart suits and fast moving and a world i understood absolutely nothing about and they said they don't care as long as you've got a big brain you know, you've got a big brain and that you've got a big brain in, in that skull of yours. So put it to work. Hmm. So I had to figure out, you know, what a, how the markets worked and 
a very steep, like we're talking vertical learning curve. Mm. So my nervous system was jacked for the next six months of trying to wrap my head around something because it's a whole, it's like a language. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a, well, it's, it's interesting, I guess, looking back now that you, I guess you're not in the industry and for, and for me too, um, you know, like of, of what it was like. Um, but also, you know, every, there was tons of great things about it. It teaches lots of good lessons and, and skills and, and then things about life, I think too, you know, especially how to deal with uh, people that are operating on edge, you know, most of the time, that's for sure. But it's interesting. You know, it's so interesting. Like I actually got into it because I, I mean, I love mathematics my whole life. So I, I went into it with the right intentions, but I had no idea what investment banking was. But the interesting thing was, is actually when I eventually got in, I would always ask these people, so like, you know, what, are, what, are you, what did you study at university? And exactly like you said, you know, you studied history and, and these other people were like, you know, I studied uh, languages and stuff. And I'm thinking, what the hell are you doing in investment banking for? <laughs> if, you, if you spend four or five, however many years of your life studying that and now you're here, it was just so weird. And I think this is the problem, like, or not problem. This is just what happens. Like you said, life kind of just gets in the way and then, and you just start, you get into this machine and uh, you, you fall into it like, uh, you know, unintentionally. And it, it seems like that's what happens to so many people. And that's why so many people say in investment banking or maybe other uh, uh, industries too, they, uh, they're not happy because it's not what they were sort of meant to actually do, but they get used to the life. They get used to the money and all these sort of things. And then they feel stuck because they don't know what else they can do afterwards, you know? And, and then, yeah, it's, it's really, really fascinating. Um, but, uh, it, it's, it's in your story, you, you looked incredibly successful to the outside world, you know, like everything is going, you know, for you, you're earning money, you're doing this, you're doing that, but actually inside you were dying and you, your relationships were sort of falling apart. You went through two marriages and also your health started, uh, sort of deteriorating, um, maybe you can just kind of walk us through that process a little bit. I'm going to back up just a tiny bit because there's one, one thing that I wanted to share that was relevant because I, I think this geysering up of this creative thing that wanted to come up before I took my job in investment banking, I had turned my obsessive overachiever onto writing for magazines. Cause I always really wanted to write for magazines. So there was one particular global glossy magazine that I wanted to write for. And I was emailing the editor. I sent cupcakes to the office. I was so mm -hmm. persistent. And she just blanked me and blanked me. And bl I must have sent like 80 emails at some stage. Wow. And then she finally, one day, I remember the old dial up modem, you know, I always check and there would be never anything there. And then one day I saw her name on and I couldn't even open it straight away. I got up and I did like Tom Cruise in Risky Business. You know, when he does that little dance. <laughs> I did that. And then I calmed myself down and I sat down and I opened the email and she said, okay, Mandy, you win. You win the top prize for persistence. I'm like, of course I do. I win the top prize for persistence. She said, the best send, <laughs> send me your stuff. Send me huh. something. And I couldn't do it. I was oh, so nice. scared. I went back to that eight year old in the closet wow. and I thought everything had led up to this moment. Somebody important who could actually make me succeed or tell me that I wasn't good enough had given me the stage said, okay, let's see what you can do. <laughs> so I was fine at the persisting part because I never thought she was going to reply. And then I could wow. keep my dream and say, oh, you know, I would have been, I would have been a contender, but nobody ever replied. Mm. So I kind of, I gave it all. And then all of a sudden when she asked me to perform, I completely went back to that moment, you know, of the, the, the stage lights in my eyes and I deleted the email. I couldn't do it. No, no way. <laughs> so you didn't go through it at all. I decided that I was going to do something serious. So I went into banking. No way. I was going to read the financial times from cover to cover every single day. And I did that and I created that. I'm going to do this banking job and I'm going to suppress all of that creative stuff because it's all just, you know, it's not going to pay the bills. I'm just going to end up eating beans on toast, being a journalist or a writer. And, you know, now I can be a pinstripe person and I can, I can make 
air quotes, real money, you know. And so doing that job, I, I completely pushed that into a locked up compartment in the back of my mind. And I said, sayonara, baby, we are now going to do something real and I'm going to be important and I'm going to be serious. Huh. And so I went into investment banking and I got completely pulled into the slipstream of that because there was lots of world travel. And a lot of that sounds super glamorous, but it's actually really exhausting. Mm. And yeah. I made, made it through my examination process because to trade, you have to go through a certain process of, you know, an examination, which was quite tricky for me, not understanding a lot of that stuff. So I had a steep learning curve and I did it. I pulled it off and I just stepped on the gas. I really accelerated in that career. And within five or six years, I had made it to director. And I thought, this is my life. This is my world. And I think that that little locked vault of all the creative stuff was there were like the gremlins inside were like banging on the lid and saying like, mm. hey, hey, remember us? Remember when you like to do fun things? Mm. Because investment banking became all consuming. It takes over any aspect of white space, at least it did for me, that existed in my life. And it, it did not do well for the marriage that I was in. And you know, then the second one, when I had a young child, broke down as well because I was consumed. I was obsessively consumed at succeeding. Mm. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? Cause like you, you're so involved in it that you're probably like, Oh, this guy is not the right guy for me and all these sort of things. But actually it's, it's probably yourself. You know what I mean? Because you're so focused on this, this career and achieving at it. Yeah. And I think being an overachiever, there's a distinction that I would like to make. Uh, I think it would be useful between being an overachiever and being a high achiever. Overachievers is definitely what I identify well, I should say past tense, but I still slide into it. So the having to be somebody to be somebody. So being an overachiever, mm -hmm. it's only a temporary fix that no matter what incredible thing you pull off, it's just like a temp, you feel this temporary alleviation of that constant sensation that you're not enough, you're not good enough, you're going to get found out, you're an imposter, all of this constant mental dialogue, which is, it's exhausting. Mm. And the overachiever attempts to achieve more and more and more. And to the outside world looks like this massive success and also looks the part, which is important. The packaging needs to match too. But mm. deep down, there's this underlying sense of it's still never enough. And will it ever be enough? So it almost like every achievement, no matter how stellar it looks, I never celebrated it because I was nexting. I was moving constantly to the next thing that would give me that temporary reprieve from feeling awful about myself and self-loathing. Mm. Whereas a high achiever, a high achiever is somebody I think of as Richard Branson, who tries loads of stuff, fails, takes the lessons from it, pivots, and also isn't particularly over-identified with the self and the achievement. So they're, they're separate things. They may be connected, but they're separate things. Whereas an overachiever is like, mm. I am my achievement. Mm. And therefore, if I can't achieve, I'm a nobody. Yeah, that's, that's, a great, uh, that's a great distinction. So thanks for making that. And it's like, so the high achiever almost, they, they don't mind failing. It's cool. It's part of the process. It's, it's not, you know, that's who they are. But exactly. the overachiever is like, yeah, no, this is no good. Yeah. So the overachiever will constantly have to throw things into that black pit, knowing that they'll, it'll never, you know, it's the itch that will never be scratched. The, the mm. feeling will never be satiated and the bar, the threshold keeps going higher and higher and higher. Mm. So after a PhD from Cambridge, like, what else do you do? Okay. Well, you get a fancy job in investment banking and you storm the career ladder like a Navy SEAL. And then the, at, at some stage, my, my body gave, gave out because, mm. you know, after my relationships couldn't hack it. And then all of a sudden, because I had relentlessly pushed my body for so long of jacking myself up on caffeine and not always eating what I should be eating and working those crazy hours. And also having a small child on top of that, and being a single mom for a, a time, my body decided it wasn't going to participate in my punishing work schedule anymore. And it was a bit of a slow burn thing, but I think particularly an overachiever 
who's used to having the, the only way I can describe this is like my body was my bitch and it was just going to do whatever I said it was going to do and it was going to behave and it was going to just do whatever I put it through and it wasn't going to complain. So I was a head on legs. Hmm. I was very disconnected from my body because my body was trying to send me messages all the time, kind of like, Hey, maybe we should lie down. Might be good to have a nap, you know, eat something green take a load off, all of that type of stuff. But I didn't want to hear any of it because it didn't jive with my, with my working life. And at some stage, the wheels started to fall off where I needed more and more caffeine and more and more wine in the evenings to be able to get to sleep. And being in this, this crazy loop of feeling like I was, I was on jumper cables all the time. Yeah. It's crazy how the stiff upper lip uh, sort of mentality is still very prevalent. Like you just got to get on with it. Uh, don't listen to the body. And I think if you resist listening to those signs for long enough, you almost don't even hear them anymore, or feel them anymore until it's too late. So yeah. I, I guess that's kind of what happened to you. So you ended up with, uh, with like severe adrenal fatigue. Um, mm. Maybe, maybe just tell us a little bit more about like, what you actually ended up experiencing and, and what, like, what you went through there. The irony is this happened full-blown after I resigned from investment banking. So hmm. I had a, a second child with my now third husband, and I decided that I didn't want to go back afterwards. So I thought I'm going to retrain and do something else. And that whole vault with all that creative stuff had blown open at this stage. So I was mothering two kids now. And I thought it was just part of being exhausted because, you know, when you have a newborn, it's just like you live in a blur for the first few years. And it really occurred to me one night I was reading my daughter, a bedtime story. We were reading snow white. I'm like, Oh, why did she choose snow white? Which is 42 pages. Why didn't we do the eight page spot can run. <laughs> and I suggested that. I was like, not that one again, mommy. And so we were lying in bed and she kept sort of tapping me on the forehead saying, no, don't sleep, mommy, don't sleep. Open your eyes, open your <laughs> eyes. And then at some stage I must have completely blanked out. And I just got this feeling that somebody was watching me and she had her nose like literally in my face <laughs> like this. And she was tracing the sockets under my eyes. And she said to me, she said, mommy, are you going to get dead? Wow. She said, you look like the witch in Snow White. And she looked so serious, like she looked deeply worried. And that kind of stopped me in my tracks because she looked so frightened. And I thought, oh my God, I'm frightening my child. And that started to bring my awareness to how much I had actually been beating myself to the ground. And it was as if when the awareness came, the doors on that just blew open. So I started to struggle to climb the stairs. Like I'd climb three or four stairs and I'd have to grip against the wall and I was huffing and puffing. And I thought, that's weird. I wonder what's going on there. Hmm. And I went to the doctor and they said, there's nothing wrong with you. And then I thought, see, I knew there was nothing wrong with me. I just need more coffee. Mm -hmm. So I started adding an extra espresso in and I hired a personal trainer and I said, I need high intensity interval training. So he, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he put me on the treadmill and I was running balls out for like a minute till I was foaming at the mouth. And, and then I got a bit of a runner's high. I'm like, woo, woo, there's juice in this. And then I remember going home afterwards after, and having a shower. And I thought I was shaking. I was absolutely shaking. And I didn't know whether it was the coffee or the in, high intensity interval training. And I completely blacked out in after I made it out of the shower. And I went into this anesthetic sleep and I slept through the school run and stuff like this started to happen that was totally unlike me wow. and I slept through my train stop coming back from coaching clients and I'd wake up you know like way at the end of the line or something else and I thought okay this is going wrong I went back to the doctor there's nothing wrong with you so I just the voice in my head was like you are weak you are pathetic hmm. and you know, all this overachiever stuff that is now full blown because I can't handle, you can't handle the pressure. Hmm. Yeah. Soft. Yeah. It's amazing to me that you're like the third or third or so person that we've spoken to lately that have had their kids like 
be this real like turning point in their life, like a well being or something like that. It's just it's just quite amazing to hear how uh, in tune kids actually are with like with their surrounds and with themselves um, way more than adults are often. Hey, mm. crazy. And I think this is part of the the wild ride of parenthood is your kids are the best university degree that you would, will ever have. The best PhD you will ever get is being a parent and learning from your kids. And that's so spot on because I think that was really such an eye opener for me in terms of something's not right. So there was a voice in my head that was not the inner critic. There was a voice that just kept saying, something's not right. Something's mm. not right. And I went back to the doctor again, a third time. And he looked over my file and was like, oh, you again. <laughs> kind of, oh, <laughs> shameful. Here I am again. And so he offered me antidepressants. And I thought, I don't think this is what's wrong with me. So I declined and I went to see a nutritional therapist and she said, oh, well, it sounds like you've got adrenal fatigue. And I said, well, what's that? And she explained the whole thing. And then she made me do this test and she called me when the results came in. She said, can you come in right away? And she showed me, she showed me what a normal person's graph looks like. And she said, wow, you really are an overachiever. Look at where your graph is. <laughs> and um, so she, she put me on a really robust regime. She said, you need to cut out coffee. You need to cut out red wine. You need to cut out chocolate. You need to cut out all of these things. And she said, you're not using these things regularly, are you? I said, no, no, no. What's of course. What does regularly mean? <laughs> and I said, okay, well, can't you give me something to tide me over? And I pulled out my phone and I was going to, sh I showed her my diary for the next three months. Like for, for sure, I'll start in the next three months, but like something that you can kind of just pump me up for the next couple of months. And she just looked at me and shook her head. She said, this is serious. This is really serious. And I said, like, define serious. Like I just face palm thinking about where I was at yeah. that stage. And yeah. I, I remember leaving from there and I was so upset because I was going to have to cancel coaching clients and speaking commitments and all of this. And then as soon as I got rid of all of that scaffolding that was holding me up, like the coffee and the wine and the chocolate and the carbs, she said, expect that you might feel a little bit worse. <laughs> <laughs> And that's actually when the whole house of cards came down. Oh. I, it, it took everything in me to even have a shower. I was wiped after having a shower. And all I could do was lay in bed and stew in my own juices. And there comes a time when you can't even sleep anymore. Mm. But I just no had worries. no energy to do. You know, I would take the kids to school and I would sleep. So I would have enough energy to go and pick them up from school. And in that amount of time of, of being there and just laying there for month after month after month, that was like the drying out period of what I realized was an addiction to achievement. Hmm. And I wish I could say I went gracefully into it, like, oh, okay. And, but I thrashed so madly at this whole thing. Like, I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm insignificant. I'm, I'm useless. I'm not contributing anything to this family. I'm not even worth it as a person anymore. And it was a really, it was a real low point. I went into a massive identity crisis because I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything. So. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be a somebody. I was worthless. Yeah, that's that's super tough. And then just so just the the adrenal for fatigue side of things, that's actually like just a massive uh, issue right now. You know, we we've we've probably spoken to four or five people on the podcast who have actually had it. Uh, there's a lady in London who does quite a lot of talks around it, uh, Rosie Millen, and um, she um, she she spent three years in bed basically mm. besides like what you said like you know getting up to maybe do an hour of work then basically in bed again for like three years it's just uh people don't realize that that this is a slow burn and it will get you and when it gets you it really 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 gets you yeah. um so so yeah. and i think a certain type of person has a tendency to be an ideal textbook candidate for adrenal fatigue and the weird thing about it is it took me more than six years to recover from this because for somebody so smart, I was a bit duh in terms of how to recover from this because 
I'd start to feel a little bit better. I'm like, oh, now I can do stuff again. And then I would go full throttle and then it would be like, rah, rah, here I am again. And doing that year after year after year. And that's when I came to this conclusion that I needed more help than just the nutritional therapist. That this was actually what she said is, we can give you so many supplements that you rattle when you walk. You mm -hmm. can sleep as much as you want, but actually this is an inside game. Mm. This is mm. you learning how to, these weren't her words, but in effect what she was saying, to go from being an overachiever into being a high achiever. Mm. Yeah. And I thought, great, I can do that. So let me, let me organize a schedule and a spreadsheet of all these things <laughs> I'm going to do. And I was trying to use my overachieving to heal. Mm. And I mean, spoiler alert, that didn't work. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. I did, I took 26 flights. I spent just under a hundred thousand dollars going on various retreats and doing all kinds of different things because I was so gung ho that I was going to heal myself. And it went through three distinct phases over the past six years. There was the gung ho phase, which is where my nutritional therapist was. So she said, you're going to follow this regime. I followed it to the T. And then she <laughs> said, you need to hire a life coach to sort out that overachiever stuff. Right. Done. I'm on the job. And so I worked with her and she said, okay, well, why don't you do something to get into your body? So she sent me as a piece of homework to do five rhythms dancing. <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I said, great, I can do that. And so then I looked it up <laughs> to see what it was. And it was just like these distinct rhythms in this free form dancing. And I was just like, oh, I <laughs> don't know how to do those steps. <laughs> So secretly I went on to Amazon and I bought some five rhythms DVDs and I had a notepad. This is like super cringy to share this, Jeez. but I was writing down <laughs> moves, you know, the moves that don't exist so that when I went to the class, I would look like I knew what I was doing. Wow. And then I turned up there and my inner critic is like, this is for crunchy people. Like these are granola types. You don't belong here. Like you're not, yeah. we're not one of these people. You're going to stand out. <laughs> And I went to this thing and I was like, I can do this. I'm look at me doing it. And nobody knows it's my first time. And just, it was, it was just crazy how I had this thing that if I could do it really well, I would heal faster. It would be, mm. I would be, I would be successful at healing. If I could do the five rhythms, like an A star <laughs> student. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. It's hard to lose that kind of, overachieve identity isn't it you know like it's a it's a slow process that's for sure um yeah it's it's so 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 we'll get onto that journey in a second but just you know like you mentioned after you uh you left investment banking you you set up your your coaching business but you 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 felt like you had lost your identity like what what does that really mean though losing your identity because i was so over identified as being somebody who was other people were constantly in awe of of how much and how fast i could get things done this is what i said makes it so insidious is i was always the person who got everything done and just seemed to pull off the impossible give me a goal any goal i will go out and solve it i will go out and achieve it and then more do more and more on top of that so I didn't think I was actually worth anything just as me. I thought that I was just a vessel for doing. And all of a sudden when I couldn't do anymore and I was drying out from my compulsion to overachieve, I didn't know who I was because my worth as a human being was dissipating every single day when I couldn't do something. Mm. So of course, the coming out the other end, of course, I realized that you don't have to be somebody to be somebody. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I didn't yet know that I just felt completely stripped of anything that I felt made me worthwhile. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, because what you say there is, is, is really fascinating is like, just to be just to exist is, is actually very hard because of the stories that we've all told ourselves. And then you know, Gareth and I listened to this podcast recently by um, Zach Bush, and he was he was actually talking about this, like the identity, the story of your life or who you are, you end up attracting things to, if you're a fixer or you're a, 
you know, you, then you identify as a fixer, then you'll have to find problems in your life all the time to have to fix stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and just to exist is, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. And I totally get why that must have been challenging. It was. It, it really felt like the bottom had fallen out of my life. And it felt like all I wanted to do was to use the overachiever because that was my winning strategy. Mm. So I wanted to use the overachiever part of me to do anything possible to get back to the old me because it felt like death. Mm. If I couldn't get back to the old me, it, it just felt like what was, the, what was the point of even existing? Mm. That's really hard. And uh, so how had you actually prepared um, for setting up your coaching business while you were still banking? How had you, was that just a an achiever thing or how had you actually done that? No, I, I knew that I liked self-development because that was one thing that I, I did as I went to a lot of courses and I'm like, oh my God, this is a thing to go and do training and, and grow yourself as a human. So I did as much of that as I could. And then afterwards, when I realized I didn't want to go back into that world with two kids and I had been off enough to lose the buzz of being in there, like to realize that there was another way of being, I had, I had to slow down because my body was starting to give me those signals and also because I, I didn't want to be away from my kids. Mm -hmm. So I thought I can use my brain to come up with something else. So I went for a coaching session to find out what else I would be good at. And she said, you'd actually be a cracking coach. <laughs> so within days, I had signed up to do an intensive coaching program and finished that at record speed and set up my business very, very quickly and started to mine my banking network for, for clients. So that happened all very, very fast. And is there anything you miss about the banking world? The paycheck? <laughs> okay <laughs> but like anything say is a non-money orientated what i really enjoyed about having to go to work every day although i was there a little too long for my liking was the camaraderie and the being up to something together mm. and also there were some really smart people there and one of the ways that i love to live my life is if you're the smartest person in the room you're in the wrong room. Mm. And I constantly love to put myself in rooms where I feel a bit like, oh my goodness, how did I get in here? Like somebody's mm. going to come and tap me on the shoulder any minute and tell me I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> so this is, this is something I miss. There were a lot of smart people there. Mm. Yeah, I can, I can seriously relate to that. And, and just, just actually being around people every day, you know, like in the office, there's, there's certain energy you get from that, you know, like personally, I, I feel like, you know, I, I get energy from other people that that's what, that's what kind of keeps me going. So it's a big adjustment for anybody that's thinking of like leaving their, their corporate job to working for themselves. There are these other things that you need to consider, you know, like if it is the right decision for you, um, you know, it's not all like, not all amazing sort of thing. Um, no, that's very yeah. true. And I think particularly with these seeing other people that you don't start shuffling around in your slippers and talking to the house plants, like it's mm. really important to get out mm. and to connect. So one thing I do as, as part of my coaching personal development is I always have a coach, at least one, even though mm. I'm a coach and I belong to a coaching mastermind where mm. I work with other people and we get out of our comfort zone together and do stuff that absolutely terrifies me in a good way. Mm -hmm. And that, that all, I want to be an edge walker in this space. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that alone because it's so easy to get lulled into your own comfort zone and to just to continue to operate from a dial tone existence. So something where you need to be around other people who challenge you and where you're not the smartest person in the room. Yeah, I love that. Can you explain what an ed edge walker, what, what do you mean by that? You can see stuff from the edges that you can't see if you're safely in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I like the idea of being somewhere where I feel a little bit of vertigo, so to speak, that it mm. feels like, ooh, there's something at stake here. And I think that's where the most interesting stuff happens in the entrepreneurial space where you're where something's at stake and where, where things can happen and you're not always in your zone of safety. Yeah. So another way of looking at it is there's a stretch zone 
and then there's a snap zone. And the snap <laughs> zone is like if you go off the edge, <laughs> that's when it becomes too much. <laughs> But there's so much dynamism and there's so much juice if we're if we're just stretching ourselves a little bit more than we feel comfortable doing. And for mm. me, that's I think where I feel most alive. What sort of things push you into that stretch zone? Doing things with other people who I really respect. So this coaching group mastermind that I belong to recently, we played something called the samurai game in LA, which is run by a guy who works with the U S military and really got us into the code of how to center ourselves. And a samurai is actually someone who serves others, a cause or a person. So we're all samurais in a way, if we're serving someone or something, and the ability to be deeply in the moment and to, to be able to be amidst distraction, to be centered in our core and to show up fully to whatever task exists in front of us. That was the, the learning that came out of that particular game. But it was physically and mentally extremely exhausting because we were in a battlefield of sorts and we played to the death. Everybody had a role to play and mm -hmm. doing something like that, that is so physically and emotionally exhausting, but exhilarating at the same time. So this is what I mean about pushing, pushing myself to the edge, but doing that in a slightly healthier way, because here in these kind of situations, I have to fail. I will fail. It's inevitable. Mm. But I think, this is as I've migrated from becoming an overachiever into a high achiever. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in due course, but this walking on the edge and the type of things are the, that take me there are the things where I fail, but I'm in good company. I'm held by others. Mm, cool. I love that. It's really cool. It's a, such a gr great way to grow, to be in this comfortable environment, you know, where you can trust the people around you to actually help you help you go forward um, and not be judged, you know, on basically what the outcome is, which is also important. Because um, everybody's going to splat in, yeah. in, one, in one situation or another, because yeah. know, the su Samurai game was just one thing that we do. We do all sorts of edgy stuff. And it, it just teaches you that most of the time, like failing is not such a big deal. You know, it's, it's so true. It's like, it's, and, and I don't know, like I, the, to me, the word failure and Craig and I talk about the word failure, like maybe we need to change the word. Like let's stop using failure because it's like this got this real negative connotation with it. Let's just like, I don't know, let's this, this challenge or whatever it is, you know, like, I mean, of course it's just a word, <laughs> but yeah, it's a learning opportunity, whatever it's, um, you know, let's not look at it as this bad negative thing. That's for sure. I um, always say, unless you're a pilot, a surgeon or an eyebrow <laughs> technician Fa failure is not a bad thing right like unless you're those three things yeah you're good that's very true very, especially <laughs> eyebrow technician <laughs> <laughs> oh classic i love that so so um you mentioned this journey that you'd been on right or that you've been on and you you've flown around the world you spent a ton of money on it and it's like basically been a healing process and you've done some rather incredible and colorful things maybe you can just sort of guide us through what some of those were and i'm just going to remind listeners before we go on that this was the point of me throwing energy spreadsheets research time and money as I started to get enough out of the adrenal fatigue, I got fibromyalgia too. So like, as soon as I got to a stage where I could, I could be functional, like, right now, the final leg of the journey, we're going to get back to the old me. That was the mission. Mm -hmm. I was on this mission and I would do whatever it took to get there. So I did the five rhythms dancing. I went to, to a tantric coach, because that was what my then coach suggested. I'm like, no, 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 no. I just had all these sort of sting and Trudy and group, <laughs> group orgies and baby oil. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> not going there. But it Too didn't far. turn out to be, it didn't, it wasn't what I expected. Hmm. So Tantra was just about getting our energies aligned. And, you know, she, again, this tantric expert that I went to, she said, you know, you're blocked. Your energy isn't coming up your body. So it reaffirmed that I was indeed a head on legs and this mm. idea of opening those channels. And 
I was just kind of sitting there rolling my eyes. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, whatever, do what you got to do, but just fix me, <laughs> fix me. I will lay here. And so I wasn't always the easiest customer back in the day because I was just trying to tick any box so that they would pony up and give me the goods so I could get back to my real <laughs> life and being who I was. So the first phase of all these activities was the gung ho phase of me just going for anything that, that, so the dancing, I went on wild woman retreats. We danced in the nude and gave up all our inhibitions. I had to dialogue with my lady parts, you know, and, <laughs> and I kept, you know, writing all these notes and bringing them back to my coach. And she's just said, I don't really think the notes are necessary. She, she said, you're using the same thing that we're mm. trying to lessen. We're trying to get you in your body. So I, I reluctantly put that aside because, you know, I'm a note taker, I'm a student, I'm a geek, I'm a PhD, and this is how I roll. And it, I realized that it wasn't going to get me better faster. So I had to listen to what she said. And then I went to see a burnout expert who's written loads of books and she's world renowned on burnout. And I thought, I wonder who I need to be. So she'll tell me the secret formula. Yeah. And she made me do various activities and all I was doing, I realized I was trying to manipulate her. It wasn't even conscious, but I, I caught myself thinking, what does she want me to do? So she'll give me the Holy grail that she'll give me the thing that I need to do. And then at some stage at the end, she was completely exasper exasperated with me. And she said, your mind is very strong. And I took it as a compliment. And then she said, it's getting in the way. I thought, oh. <laughs> She said, what if this is the best you're ever going to feel? I was like, hell no. I, I, I was so gung-ho that I was going to get this. And she said, you're not ready. You're not ready to heal. And I said, what are you talking about? I got so angry at that stage. I thought, I've paid all this money to you. I'm thinking this. And you're not giving me the thing that I came for. And I got so irritated. And she said, give up hope. And then I started to cry and I left and she said, Oh, would you like to book another appointment? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then I thought, well, she's some expert. She is <laughs> give up hope. I mean, you can't say that to your clients. That was what I was <laughs> thinking at the time. And then I thought I need an even more important coach. So I flew to Arizona to sit with a guy known as the ultimate coach. So his title was very seductive. I thought he's going to be the magic eight ball. He's going to tell me what I need to do. So mm. I flew 12 hours to sit in his presence for a couple of hours. And he said, we save ourselves. Nobody's coming. Mm. And I thought you could have told me that on Skype. <laughs> 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 and oh, then... Classy. This is where things started to be really hard and I couldn't, I couldn't dazzle anyone with my achievements. I couldn't use my smarts to get them to give me the thing. And it, I, it almost felt like I wanted to have a tantrum. It's like nothing, nothing was working. Mm. And finally I joined this coaching mastermind and I thought there's going to be some smart people here and they're going to tell me what to do because I'm sure some of them have gone through it. And so we had to, we had to pair up with, somebody in the group. And I chose this guy who, you know, he, had, he looked very well put together and he was very smiley and we sat together and he said, Mandy, I've been watching you. You know, you, you always look very well put together and you say the right thing. And you're I'm, I'm a little bit intimidated by your intelligence. And I was getting really oh, I quite like this. This feels quite good. <laughs> and then he said, I don't buy it. He said, you fool everybody in this room. He said, but you don't fool me. He said, all this stuff, he said, pointing at me and my sharp suit and my groin piercing pair of ankle boots that I was using and all, you know, <laughs> my slick exterior. He said, I want to tear all that down. He said, I see you. Uh, wow. And I just looked at him and gaped a little bit. Like, um, okay. And he said, you're just hustling. He said, what is all this the front, like what is it trying to cover up? What is it that you don't want the world to see? And then something in the course of this conversation cracked me open. He said, who you are is so much more compelling than who you're trying so hard to be. 
Hmm. And then I started ugly crying at this stage. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, my mascara was going all down my face. And I'm, of course, side-eyeing across the room, like, who's watching? Who's seeing all of this happening? And then he said, you're still in it. Hmm. He said, you're letting us see just enough of you. You know, you can dab at your cheeks with the tissues. He said, but you're still playing. You're playing at being vulnerable. You're playing at being real. He said, but I can't feel your humanity. Mm -hmm. And that was like taking a bullet. Mm -hmm. Goodness. But he was right. He said, you fool everybody. You are such a performer. You're even performing at being human. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized that I couldn't spreadsheet or overachieve my way. This was like a much bigger journey than I expected it was going to be. This was actually an unbecoming of all kinds of ways of being and habits and layers and layers of armor that I had put on. So if I was going in to do naked dancing and having conversations with my vagina and whatever else, if I was still <laughs> armored up, it it wasn't going to help, right? Mm -hmm. Like I could look like the A plus student doing it, but that wasn't the point. Yeah. That's so interesting. You, you, it sounds like Mandy, like that you, you started to learn how to feel, you know, like really just feel the emotions that you had there the whole time, but you were actually allowing yourself to, to start feeling them and, and become connected to your body again, you know, like, not just the head on legs, you know, like there, there was something in between there that you weren't connecting with. And, and those are not necessarily nice feelings. And I think that's the thing that people often shy away from is, you know, when you are going through that process, it's like, it isn't easy. It is hard. And, and some of the stuff that you start to see about yourself, you don't like um, necessarily, you know, and, uh, but that's ultimately where you have to go. Otherwise it's, it's once again, you will look for an outside fix again. You'll look for someone else to help or something else to help or the magic bullet. And uh, ultimately, you, I guess you realize like it's all inside of you. And the thing is, nobody could have told me that at the beginning because I wouldn't mm. have believed them because slowly I was morphing from being an overachiever to a high achiever, but also bringing, trusting my humanity. And so the, there was the gung ho phase. Then there was the nothing I've ever done works anymore phase, the kind of Ugh, nobody's coming. And then the third phase was exactly what you just said about having to feel the backlog of feelings that I had suppressed with a huge manhole cover from the neck down. Mm. And I did a primal scream session as part of my things that I was going to do to recover. And this really put me into my body. And the, the person leading this group, he does a lot of men's work, women's work, a guy called John Wineland, and I was in Sedona. And we had had a morning of sitting on a mountainside with a shaman and doing a meditation and just connecting with the energy of this particular mountain, which was called La Kachina, the mother, which is where the Hopi and Navajo tribes you know that that was their area and the the power of the feeling of the feminine and i had never really allowed myself to feel feminine i thought that meant we're like wearing pink and rosy dresses and stuff like that or because it was never safe for me to be soft and feminine yeah. which is why i was always armored up and on this mountainside i had this vision of all of these women my ancestors, me as a child, my mother, all these women who were working the land and friends. And this vision came to me so powerfully. And, you know, I was not the kind of person who had visions. <laughs> so all of a sudden I thought, okay, this is interesting. And from there we went, I explained what had happened. And I was then chosen to be the recipient of this primal scream session to have this gentleman help me to release all of these feelings and and to breathe and to be witnessed by you know they created this energetic circle that we stood in and i i was standing eye to eye with actually this same chap who said i see the real you and i want to tear all this stuff down mm -hmm. it was we were paired together and and i was being coached by john and he said you know i want you to breathe and sink you know, Adam will hold the space for you. He can take it all. So Adam represents all men. 
Hmm. And then he, he took me, John took me back to my childhood of all the times that I felt humiliated or all the times that I felt not good enough to hear the voices, to feel the feelings because I had never felt those feelings. I just pushed them down because they, they mm. felt yucky. Mm. And all of a sudden I started to shake and the, I was moving and, you know, there were like no hallucinogens or no alcohol nothing involved. Like this was all just pure breathing and having an expert pull that out of you. And all the times as a young woman and, you know, the time that any boyfriend or all of the, any toxic thing that had ever happened and all of these relationships that I had gotten into that ended up going horribly wrong. And he said, I want you to keep breathing, keep breathing. And I was practically labor breathing at this stage, you know, it was <laughs> really intense. And he said, now I want you to let all of that out as a sound. And we were in this big conference room and all of a sudden it was like my throat blew open and the noise that came out of me filled this conference room hmm. and the release that came out it was it was something i can i can't put words to it yet i'm still struggling with how to write about this in my book but the noise that just it felt like the most incredible release and then that happened a couple of times. And he said, now I want you to imagine it for your mother and all the women in your family, all the women who have suffered and been humiliated and hurt and abused. And it was the same thing. And he said, all the women on this planet who have been hurt, abused, humiliated, harmed, not respected. And I felt completely empty, like a drum at the end of it. And it wasn't a feeling of empty as a void. It was a feeling of being full of possibility. And I was at least three inches taller after that. I, f I felt so tall. Mm -hmm. And that feels like the beginning of my new life right there. And that was where wow. my overachiever, it still lurks like a cold sore virus in my system. Like it's always there. And it, you know, at certain times it will come up again, but I was free at that stage. Powerful. What a crazy experience, but what a powerful moving experience. And that's the power of, of groups and uh, uh, good facilitators and, yes. and, and also obviously being vulnerable enough to allow yourself to take that path and do that. So great, like number of things coming together there for that healing. It's, it's really amazing. Mm. Um, but maybe just for the other overachievers out there um, you talk about enoughness uh, what does that actually mean i think enoughness and i can only speak from personal experience here is coming to a state of inner peace of knowing that part of me will never be enough to satiate that that overachiever in me and that's okay mm. because there's nowhere to get to. There's nothing more to be all of the beauty. And this sounds like such a cliche, but all of a sudden I understand it in a profoundly different way that all we really have is being open in this moment and being connected to one another in mm. this moment. And for me, being enough is actually swapping trying to be impressive and choosing on a breath by breath basis to be real. Mm. Because when we try to impress and when we try to achieve so that we will be bestowed with status and, and titles and you know, that other people will revere us, it creates distance. It kind of ivory towers us, you know, mm. whereas to be deeply, the thing that all I ever wanted was to be connected and to belong. And I just went about it the wrong way. To be revered and to be admired actually is a separator. Wow. Yeah. So, so the, the congruency in your life now is actually part of your adrenal fatigue was probably you not feeling 100% congruent with, you know, who you thought you should be and who you were and, and that's ultimately tiring, but now you, 
have this congruency within yourself and being real. And it's a practice. Like, as I said, I'm not sitting on the mountainside with my Yoda robes on. It's, Mm -hmm. it's a day by day, sometimes a moment by moment practice to, there's a certain feeling that I get in my body when I know I'm hustling for worthiness. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, for example, if I'm coaching somebody who's a really important person in the banking world, (laughs) I met the other me (laughs) once. It was really interesting because (laughs) she was late and she walked in and the sliding glass doors open. She wafted into the room and she put her phone, which was buzzing constantly on. And, and she said, right, we were supposed to have 90 minutes. We only have 30 minutes. So let's talk fast. And she told me about her whole life. She's talking to speed. And she said, right, what can you do for me? I want more life huh. balance. I want to see my kids. And immediately I found myself, I found myself attracted to that again. I was like, oh, <laughs> wow, that's who I used to be. And it was so seductive to get pulled into that. And she had this razor sharp suit on and, 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 you know, these, this slick back hair and expensive skin. And she just, she smelled like money and power. (laughs) And, and I felt so kind of lumpy and frumpy and dumpy. And I thought I've lost that edge somehow. And then I was discombobulated because I felt like the way to be powerful was to try to match her vibe. Mm. Huh. So I don't think it goes away, but I caught myself and I could breathe. Like I could use my one breath rule to, to catch myself several times in that conversation that I don't need to impress her. I just need hmm. to hold space. I just need to breathe. I need to be present. I need to be open. So it's a moment by moment by moment practice. I, have, I haven't arrived, but I'm okay with that. That's part of the enoughness is I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be in this moment. Oh. Hmm. I love that. So much great advice there and uh, just good ways of being, that's for sure. So how do you actually uh, manage your achievement addiction these days? I think looking at if I, if I'm really tempted to overgive and overdo at something, I ask myself this question, what is it that I'm craving? Mm. And then when I come up with the answer, So for example, if I noticed that I was overdoing on the book that I'm writing, which is telling this story, I was working way too many hours. I was, you know, sitting in front of the laptop too much. So it was a day where I didn't even go outside and I thought, oh, wow, I'm sliding into that old way of being. And then what I thought is, what am I craving? And I thought, you know what? I want to open that box that I closed in my twenties. That's what I'm craving. And then I thought, why is it that I'm craving that? And the answer was, because this is my purpose. I want to feel connected to my purpose. So then I just bring my learning into this. Is there a softer way? Is there a lighter way to hold my craving to be connected to my creativity? And I realized that it's not the right tool to use my overachieving to go about the creative pursuit that I'm in. It's like trying to cut an oak tree with airline cutlery, you know, like it's not the right tool for that. So I catch myself by asking, what is it that I'm craving? Hmm. What is the, in that 20 year old box that was or your, your, when you were 20 years old, what is in that box? When, when I was willing to put my, my creative work out there, you know, the whole magazine thing. Hmm. And Interestingly, I have written a column for Psychology's magazine since then, (laughs) and I'm going to start writing a digital column for them again soon. So the willingness to put myself, my imperfect, real, non-overachiever, non-hustler, still learning, half-baked self out there with my creative work, knowing that it's not going to be for everybody and knowing that I will be criticized and knowing that people will take cheap pot shots and they will, it's mm. not for everybody. And I'm okay with that. Yeah. That's great. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you think <laughs> very free kind of, <laughs> it's very free kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe Mandy, you can actually just tell us a little bit more about what you actually do now and, and also uh, what you, you know, what you love now about the work setup that you have and, and your different sort of mindset about it all. One of the things that I do now is I coach overachievers. Mm -hmm. I coach people who identify 
very, very highly with their output and who know that it doesn't serve them. So I help them to get clear on whether their winning strategy is serving them or not, because there comes a time where what got you here won't get you there. Or as my samurai game instructor said, the horse you rode into town won't be the horse you ride out of town. <laughs> and um, so people who are at that transition of they're trying and trying and trying to use a winning strategy that has served them powerfully and they just aren't getting the juice out of it. So those are certain types of people I coach. And I also help number twos to become number ones in the corporate world. And I try to help them do that in a sane and more balanced way and teaching them that you don't have to be an overachiever. You can actually get there much quicker and make the journey much more pleasant by being a high achiever. So that's, that's the gist of what I do in my, in my working life. I also go into a lot of corporates, uh, mostly investment banks and law firms, because that's my hood. And I do corporate training around mindset and around how we can aspire to care differently what other people think, as opposed to, you know, not caring what people think is its own kind of hustle. Mm. Uh, and just how we can be, take more and more layers of armor off and how we can be more deeply connected because I think that's how we do our best work is yeah. when we, when we take down our armor and when we come at it with more vulnerability. Totally. You definitely have a lifetime of work there for sure in the corporate industry, trying to, trying to get that into a sort of mindset. That's for sure. Because you know, that vulnerability just doesn't exist because it's a weakness in the workplace. But uh, the more people like yourself who can go in there and explain to them and sort of make it more clear, the better, you know, because it is actually, I think, stifling people's success and, and happiness and enjoyment and these sort of things. And uh, you know, it's, it's important that it does actually in a way, start in the workplace because we spend so much time there you know and um yeah so so great great stuff that's really amazing i think you need some primal screaming in the workplace yeah. well, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so as as like a, an overachieving coach and and sort of coaching these people that are sort of i don't know like high-end whatever um, achievers um are there any common themes you know in terms of issues that they're facing I think a lot of people have nervous systems that are completely on jumper cables, like I said I was. So they're, they're disconnected from their bodies. And I think this is one of the things because our, we're only using 50% of our awareness and our intelligence because the body holds so much wisdom. So I think one of the things I see as a theme is this hesitancy to be in the body and it's not even necessarily a conscious thing but the sense of being disembodied the sense of being incredibly cerebral and being cut off from the neck down that's mm. one of the key things that i see another thing is being so this goes back to the nervous system thing being so time poor and being constantly rushed from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting jumping in cabs jumping on airplanes going from one meeting room to one client call to the next thing is the lack of any white space mm -hmm. and the just living in a reactive way as opposed to living in a created way mm -hmm. and not seeing any possibility for that feeling at the mercy of living a reacted to life and deeply wishing for and wanting to be able to get out of these kind of golden handcuffs, to be able to create a life where there is more space because, and I keep telling them all the time, miracles happen when there's space. Mm. Creativity happens when there's space. Mm -hmm. Connection happens when there is space. <laughs> so I think those are two that immediately come to mind. Mm. So powerful. I think it's uh, not just in the banking industry that people are disconnected and, uh, cerebral and uh, live in their in their in their thoughts and it's it's quite amazing what you're saying because it's 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 like it, there's definitely this movement towards um just going within and just feeling and being more present and it's great because the, the way you bring it across is is 
is so tangible. So yeah, definitely keep up that amazing work. It's, it's great. And you know, one way you're going to be doing that is, is, um, is through this book that you've been writing for six years and, you know, um, yeah, you, you're, you're 48 now and you're looking fantastic. So like, you know, you've got lots of great things coming up. Can you tell us about the, the book that you're busy writing? The book is about this journey and the working title right now is The Good Enoughist. <laughs> and the, the journey is really exactly what I've outlined today of going from this place of being very cerebral, very, very driven, very over-identified with my achievements, having it all taken away from me, not because I willingly let it go, quite the opposite. And thinking that I was going on this journey to reclaim myself and having done all of these things and spent all this money and created these spreadsheets and all these things that I'm going to do to get back to the old me. My husband at one said we were here in the, in the kitchen and I was making Earl Grey tea, I remember it. And I said, I've done all these things and I, I can't get back. I have never failed at something on such an epic scale. Like I can't get back to the old me. It feels mm. like she's a balloon in the sky disappearing little by little and soon she'll be gone forever. Mm. I don't know what else to do. How do I get back to her? And he just said very nonchalantly, he said, well, what if, what if we don't want the old you back? <laughs> what if we prefer the softer you? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you could have said that. He said, I did. <laughs> So it's this journey of bringing down those layers and layers of armor and feeling myself dismantling at some stage consciously my winning strategy and allowing the backlog of feelings to come up and not being afraid that I was going to be stuck in this black hole of feelings forever. Because like Brene Brown says, I think she's part of the zeitgeist at the moment because mm. she's so popular. She's tapped into something we cannot selectively feel. Mm. And this is, I think, one reason that so many people are unhappy and plying themselves with titles and shiny things, looking for that the golden pellet of happiness and joy that never actually you know, it never, we never feel satiated because we can't mm -hmm. feel it because we don't want to feel the yucky stuff. So therefore we don't feel the good stuff either. Mm. So allowing ourselves to feel, and sometimes it's painful, but these feelings don't tend to last as long as we're afraid they are, they do. So it's this journey of the aspiring to get somewhere, going at it with everything I've got, realizing that that self like in every hero's journey at the middle point, something or someone has to die. And in that mm -hmm. case, it was the overachiever. Mm -hmm. And then kind of coming out the other side and winging it a bit of like, hmm, okay, well, mm -hmm. how can I be powerful when I'm also soft? And how can I be connected when I don't need to impress? Like it, it, I'm, I'm in that learning curve of learning how to be in this place because it's, it's very exciting, but it's also very discombobulating. Mm -hmm. That's what the and journey sometimes... is about. That's what the book is about. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah. And sometimes I suppose the achievement is in the yucky stuff, as you say, is overcoming those yucky and horrible times. And, and that's where you can find that achievement. So, yeah, man, it sounds like a great, it's going to be a great read. That's for sure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And you know what the thing is like, you live in the best city for, you know, for the, the work that you're doing because <laughs> there's just thousands of people that are like in the same situation that you were, you know, and like uh, are looking to kind of get out and, and what it is. And they, they need people like you to kind of open them up to this other side um, of, of what there is in, in life and, and, you know, how, how they can help themselves. So, so what, what like say maybe to, uh, bits of advice could you impart on on our listeners for them to you know to take this first step or just to be a kind of a better more confident comfortable version of themselves i think one would be to get into the practice of holding life and even more specifically holding failure more lightly because often people who identify as overachievers or perfectionists, they want to get everything right all the time. And if we bring a sense of playfulness 
to that if we bring a sense of holding the whole thing lightly it's one of my favorite questions i ask my coaching clients if they bring some kind of a conundrum to me where there's something at risk and i say what would it look like if you held that lightly and all of a sudden they have this visceral reaction, their shoulders kind of drop a couple of inches and they take a breath and they close their eyes. And we often make things way more serious. And we, we often go through so much of life white knuckling, like having an outcome need to look a certain way. And if we could just hold things more lightly, I think the journey is much more enjoyable because we can't force outcomes anyway. This is one of the biggest learnings I've come out of my, you know, my constantly recovering overachiever is I thought I could force outcomes. I thought I could make things happen by sheer stubbornness and by will. And I mean, I'm an Aries as well. So this type A Aries, like just, (laughs) we're going to force this to happen. (laughs) And sometimes things just don't happen. Like I think Dalai Lama said, you know, it's the funniest thing that we think we're under control. We, that we control anything. He said it more profoundly, but that's the gist of it. (laughs) So if we can understand that we're all winging it and if we could just hold things with more playfulness and more lightness, some things are too important to be taken too seriously. Hmm. I think that's one thing that I would say. And the second thing is, is get out there and do stuff that makes you feel uncomfortable. And I'm Mm -hmm. not talking about, you know, wearing shoes that pinch or anything like that. I I mean, like, (laughs) going out there and doing things to figure out if you were going to walk your edge, if you were going to get out of your comfort zone, Mm -hmm. what would that look like? Whether it's, you know, like for me, it was doing the Tantra stuff and the five rhythms dancing and all of this stuff that I used to roll my eyes at and think it was like really woo woo. And Mm -hmm. those things like that was a big stretch for me. And ideally, if you can do it with other people who you respect, that you're not the smartest person in the room. So I'm just coming back to that wisdom because I think we can't hear that enough times. Putting ourselves in situations with other people who support, love us, and who have our back, but that you're leaning into something constantly where there's a possibility of failure and where there will be a certainty of failure. Because then we realize like, As I said, unless you're a surgeon, pilot, or eyebrow technician, it's great to get into the habit of failing on a regular basis. Hmm. Amazing. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Because it just, you know, once it's happened, you realize that wasn't so bad. You know, what's the worst case scenario? It was not even close to as bad as I was anticipating. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great to get practiced at these kinds of things. So And it also allows people to, appreciate and to tap into our humanity because Mm. if we're always perfect we look perfect we say the perfect thing people can't relate to us and this is what what you know what that coach said to me like where is your humanity Mm. like i want to see you mess up like i want to see you with spinach in your teeth i want to see you crack a joke that nobody laughs at you know i want to see you get messy (laughs) because then i can relate to you Mm. i can feel you that way that's that's really amazing and that's definitely the tenets that we sort of run the podcast by as well is just it's okay you know it's okay to be there and see and i see you for who you are that's it's so great and so what are you excited about moving forward into the future and and what do you have coming up and and also um maybe just after that you can just tell our listeners um how they can get in touch with you i am really excited about i have just failed epically at sending out my book proposal. I sent it to an editor in New York and she said, I love the writing, but we need to start from scratch on this. So (laughs) I noticed myself immediately going into it, trying to fix it, like cover up the feeling of disappointment by taking immediate action. Mm. And I let myself feel the yuckiness of disappointment and frustration and, and all of that. So I'm really excited now when I've given myself a couple of days to feel the feelings I can come back to it with complete vigor and juice and a suppleness that creativity Mm. requires. So if we come at something like creativity, the outcome needs to look like this, it's going to happen on this time frame. you know, the universe just laughs and laughs and laughs. So I'm really (laughs) excited to get back into this project and 
feeling like I've kind of cleansed the whiteboard of my mind by allowing myself to feel the feelings and my body feels happy because I haven't suppressed it. So that is what I'm looking forward to. So I'm hoping that that will, that will challenge me and I can hold it lightly. That's something mm. that I'm really looking forward to. And I'm sorry, I've completely blanked uh, on the second and, part of your question. And yep. where can, and how can people get in touch with you? So my social media of choice is Instagram. I hang out there and I put profound stuff up there and I put really silly stuff up there and everything in between. So I hang out there pretty much every day. And also there's two other ways on my website, go and have a nose around there and see if there's something for you there. And that's just mandyletto.com. I'm sure that'll be in your show notes. And mm. I also do a podcast since we are all fans of the mic here in this group called Moxie cast. And that is the podcast for life lift off. So I interview mostly coaches. They're not all coaches, but a lot of individuals who are on their own journeys, who have very practical tips. I'm, I'm really keen that people have practical takeaways from usually things to do with how we be. And I know that's grammatically incorrect. Mm -hmm. It's not a doing podcast. It's how we be in the world while we're doing. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love that. Great stuff. Well, thanks so much for sharing all of that. And just our last question is, um, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Oh, I have an answer for that immediately. <laughs> is exactly what it says on the tin, is being willing to be more ridiculous, being willing to laugh. And I'm talking like belly laugh at mm. ourselves and the way that we show up. And what I mean by this is I even before I, I knew about your podcast, this is something that I practice being ridiculously human is when I find myself getting crotchety, triggered, upset by something, I pull myself out and I almost watch myself on CCT cam. Like, there I am all <laughs> clenched up and my lips are like a cat's bum and just like <laughs> vibing all this negative energy. And I just put on Benny Hill music in my mind. Like something to make the situation feel a bit ridiculous. And all of a sudden the mood passes. And I think if we can That's learn cool. to be more fun and funny and hold ourselves more lightly too, the whole mm -hmm. human experience becomes so much more gratifying. Mm -hmm. Love it. Super well said. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Manny. Seriously, like, honestly, like, I don't even know where to begin to say thank you because it's just been <laughs> such an incredible chat. And, and I honestly wonder if there's, something telepathic going on here because the whole way through the chat, I was like, this is the next Brene Brown, next Brene Brown. <laughs> and then you go and you mention her name and I'm like, what? How, how is that even possible out of 7 billion people in the world? You choose the exact same name that I'm thinking, you know, mm. but, uh, but it's, it's it, it, honestly, um, you've really just provided so much uh, wisdom, so much light, um, and, and it's all through your own story, which is incredible. And, um, I, I, I literally like, we do this, uh, the, the separate podcast, uh, although it's kind of, it's like a bonus series called superhumanship. And, um, we basically deep dive into what we speak about, uh, with, with you, for example. And, um, I literally cannot wait to do it now because it's just going to be, we, we, we've got so much. It's been such an incredible chat, but, but you, you're just such a, smart lady um your story is uh, brilliant um and the the lessons that you've sort of pulled out yourself you know have been amazing and also just how it's just really great how you've kind of i guess deconstructed yourself you know you've taken all these layers away and you've just become this observer and there's so much power. There's so much that's so powerful about that, you know, when we actually start understanding how we've become what we, what we are, but also uh, what we need to do to sort of get rid of all of that so that we can become somebody else and your story and, and everything you've gone through is, is testament to that. And um, it gives other people permission to do the same thing, which I think is important, you know, uh, especially for overachievers. Um, this is something that they need to start being able to see and your story uh, allows them to do that. So thank you so much. You speak incredibly well, seriously, like <laughs> Craig is going to have the best podcast edit ever <laughs> because <laughs> there's going to be hardly anything to edit. Um, so just thank you so much for your time. It's just been really enthralling. 
It has been such a fun conversation. And what I particularly love about this that really touches my heart is the fact that you have seen me in this imperfect winging it state and you have commented that this came across to you as powerful. This has been something I haven't found how to do yet. So you're the first to acknowledge that that really touches my heart, that there are more ways to be powerful. And this whole process of transformation, and even if somebody listening isn't an overachiever, we are all transforming. As long as we have a pulse, we are transforming. And there comes a time when we're in the middle of the transformation, in the bug soup, you know, when the caterpillar has turned completely into that liquidy mess <laughs> of like, what is this going to come out as? And then even when the butterfly emerges, it sits on the branch and it sort of dries its wings for a long time. It's a long, complicated process. So for anybody listening who's in the bug soup, <laughs> you know, something, something will change. This will change. Mm, so true. So it's true. so tempting to slide back into our old habits because mm. we know what it feels like to be powerful like that. Mm, but totally. when you're in the bug soup, you think like, oh man, am I, am I ever going to turn up and be powerful ever again? <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for saying yeah. that. And thank you for having, having this conversation. It's been so much fun to show up here and just jam with you guys. Uh, that's like, awesome. well, that is real, real briefly from my side, man, you like, uh, exactly, you know, what Gareth said, but, uh, you know, you, you really are smart, but approachable. And I love that because you, you said earlier, you know, you might feel intimidated around certain people and that, and I think you're the kind of woman who is, is highly intelligent and you could quite easily feel, um, you know, inferior to someone like yourself because you've, you've got a lot of knowledge and, you know, but you, you very embracing. And, and I think that's a, a true testament to you being a great human being, but also a great coach. Um, and the other thing that I really felt while you were chatting the whole time was your connection. You, uh, you know, I felt very connected to you because of the way you speak uh, and the way you are, but also you are very much connected to yourself and, and the way you are and the way you are being. Um, and I think it's great. It's just a, it's just such a great testament to the work that you've done. So um, I'll definitely won't be holding too lightly onto this chat because I'd rather glean as much as I can from it, as Gareth said, for our next chat, which is great. Um, but yeah, just thanks again for, for being so uh, succinct and hi highly achieving in this, in this con podcast. Cause there's so much <laughs> take. And uh, we just want to wish you all the very best for the book. We can't wait to check that out as well. Thank you both so much. It's been really a pleasure. Cool. Great. Cool stuff. Thank you. Cool, Mandy. That's amazing. Breaking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging.